Good afternoon and welcome to this event in the 8th Berwick Literary Festival. My name is Keith Montgomery. I will say more about me later. There'll be a question and answer session. However, questions can be submitted at any time. And please use the Q&A function in your Zoom. This function can be found at the bottom of your screen by hovering the cursor over the toolbar. The questions will be read out by me. We are very grateful today to our sponsor, Keith Thomas of Premier Building and Restoration. We are very lucky to be joined this afternoon by Simon Acom, the author of many an article for various publications, and of course his book entitled The Changing of the Guard, the British Army since 9-11. Simon held what some people call a gap year commission in the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards, Scotland's only cavalry regiment. He then attended Oxford University. He won a scholarship to study at Columbia Journalism School, and in 2010 won the professional strand of the Guardian's International Development journalism competition. He has worked for the New York Times, Reuters and Newsweek. And his work has appeared in many publications, including The Economist, Outside, The Washington Post, GQ, Bloomberg New Business Week, The Financial Times, The New Statesman, The New Republic and The Paris Review. Simon's book on the British Army is a tour de force of the problems and changes that came about because of the Army's involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan. Simon pulls no punches in his book, and he gives his analysis of why the army was not successful in these, camp these protracted campaigns. I can thoroughly recommend this book to you and reading this book to you. Our talk today is hugely timious with the recent withdrawal from Afghanistan fresh in our minds. I have been drawn in to be Simon's prompt and facilitator this afternoon. I served in the Royal Engineers from 1972 on a cadetship at Edinburgh University for the first four years until I left in March 2001. That was some six months before 9-11. Although I was in the joint headquarters for the first Gulf War, I'm part of the generation that did most of its training in West Germany in preparation for any invasion from the East. Because of this, I found Simon's book fascinating. I can identify with a lot of what he wrote about, as well as knowing a number of the people. Early on in this book, he said, soldiering is unique. Unlike almost any other career, it is possible to spend a working lifetime as a soldier without ever doing the job for real. That difference makes it very hard to keep the military blade sharp in peacetime. I was that generation. Clearly the army had to change. I'm not sure that my training as an atomic demolitions munition officer in Germany was much use in Iraq or Afghanistan. Simon's book investigates the reasons for failure the changes that were necessary and whether or not they happened and the time frames involved. Today, we are joined by people with a huge spectrum of knowledge of the army. It ranged from people whose knowledge is based on what they read in papers, to ex-military who took part in the campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan, to old soldiers like myself who left before 9-11. The British Army has always been seen as a fundamental and important part of our society. And it's not always easy to admit mistakes and shortcomings. Simon's book is a very readable account of why we did not succeed in Iraq or Afghanistan. Simon, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Keith, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. It's, it's very difficult to know where to start. Some would say that some of the analysis in your book is controversial. Others would say that your book is much about Britain and the politics of failure as it is about the military. Perhaps you would like to comment on this. Yeah, sure. I mean, thanks also for the, the gracious introduction. I was I was fascinated to hear your mention of an atomic demolition, which I would be very uh, very interested to hear more about later. I mean, as as you'll be aware, Keith, and I'm, I'm sure people are listening, that this book has generated a, a certain amount of controversy since it appeared earlier this year. Um, it has, I think, also though stimulated a debate that needed to happen. And that given now it's six or seven years since British troops came off the ground in Afghanistan, that actually can happen now. I think often during conflicts that these issues are raw because the stakes are very high. And ultimately, if, if people are coming home injured or, or there are casualties, then it's it's very difficult to, to take a step back and, and to look at things perhaps a bit more analytically. But in some ways, the most touching part of this experience for me has actually been the 
the letters that I've received um, since the book has come out from a lot, not exclusively, but from former British uh, personnel, a lot from the Iraq and Afghanistan generation, but also from further back. So I've had people of, of your generation writing about their experience in, in Germany in the 80s and, and going back right to the 1950s. And what has I found been very positive is it seemed as though my book has in some ways permitted there to be a space for a discussion and a reflection that maybe was not there before. Yeah, no, I, I agree, because certainly reading it, it opened my eyes, mm. and I suddenly developed, you know, thought about what we did, and, you know, I could identify with an awful lot, an awful lot of what you said. It, it, leading on from that, it seems that you were not trying to win everyone uh, as friends when you wrote your book. Um, may I ask you what drove you to write it, and to what was your target audience? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think no one jo writes a book for a single reason in the same that no one, the same way that no one would join the military, for example, for a single reason. But I can talk about the process and the sequence of events that um, led led to the book, really. And so it originally goes back to when I was 18. So after I left school in 2003, I did, as you say, a, a, a short period in the army that was variously known as the short service limited commission or gap year commission and i didn't come from a family that had military experience or connections but i'd done cadets at school under the leadership of a an inspirational history teacher and a lot of us went to the army and i i had this this snapshot um that the terms of engagement on an sslc were that you because you had minimal training you could not be sent on operations but you were in a unit of the field army and i was in a tank regiment in germany that had just come back from the initial invasion of Iraq. And so I had this, this kind of snapshot, a brief you know, snapshot of the army. Uh, and then I went to university, I did English, and I, I became a journalist. So I, um, I had an extraordinary opportunity to go to the United States to train at Columbia as a reporter. And then I worked at the New York Times in New York, and then later as a, a freelancer for Reuters and for The Economist in Africa and for Newsweek back here. So I developed a, the beginnings of a career as a journalist. But I had this, um, I would say, lingering interest in the army and in, in what had become of it, really, because 10 years on, I realized that that glimpse that I had had in 2003, 2004 was a significant period in that it was after the invasion of Iraq had initially begun, but before the southern Afghanistan tours had begun. It was also, in effect, the, the kind of last glimpse of the, the post-Cold War army that um, that I saw so still in large part based in Germany but the reason for it being in Germany that your generation had experienced had come to an end with the end of the Cold War and it was also an army that had a very high sense of itself and its competences and I think that was not entirely or even in, in many ways fantastical at that period the army was coming off two decades of success so the Falklands in 1982 the first Gulf War in 1991, Balkan operations, Kosovo, Sierra Leone, these, these operations were successful. And although a number of them were in large part American operations with a smaller British contingent, they, the success was real. So the army, as I'm sure you will remember from that time, had a, a high and I think in many ways quite legitimately high image of itself. And I was fascinated by what these campaigns had done to that. And I was able to get myself to Afghanistan in 2014 on an assignment for The Economist as the British mission was coming to an end. So I was in um, Kabul and I, I visited Bastion as well in, in Helmand. And it, it, was a, you know, it was a short trip, less than two weeks, but it gave a kind of updated snapshot. And, and it, I was struck by all sorts of small things at first. So the boots were suede, not leather. The camo was different. There was a new four stock under the SAAT, the main infantry rifle. But it also seemed that this, this institution had changed and it changed substantially. And I had this idea that I could use those two personal points of reference. So this snapshot of the army that I'd had at the end of my adolescence and this, this trip a decade later and fill out what was in between and to write a book that was about the army, but was really a book about Britain told through the lens of the army. And I think what permitted this project, and it's interesting, you know, you touched upon the, the ruffling of feathers, which certainly I did, was that I think if you're going to write about an institution, you need to be both an insider and an outsider. So I, I had, a, had a glimpse of the army, um, you know, I'd spent long enough 
in it that I understood the terminology and the rank structure and, and the language. And as you know yourself, it is an institution with its own language, but I was not beholden to it. And I had forged a career in, in another sector. And I think because of various structural factors that I discussed in the book, the debate about the military in Britain is often quite circumscribed. And I felt, I mean, the, 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 some of the criticisms level of the book have been that I was a, an angry young man or, you know, things like that. And I think I would contest parts of that, but I would say that I was not beholden in the way that that some and I wasn't was not a professional defense correspondent as well so you know I had a bit more freedom in, in that sense and I also felt that there was a need for some kind of serious discussion for for a reckoning in some ways particularly because from that brief period when I was a, a teenager I remember really driven into to me was this idea that fundamental to to the army and particularly to leadership in, in the officer corps was this idea of accountability, that it was about responsibility and about carrying accountability, particularly for the, the lives of individuals under your command. And it seemed that, that what had subsequently happened did not accord to those values. So, I mean, it was a, that, that's a rambling answer. It was a long process, but I think it was a mix of, I had had a glimpse of the army. I, I was enough of an insider to know my way around it, but I was enough of an outsider to, to bring some rigor to it. I had enough professional heft as a journalist to do it and I felt that there was a story that needed to be told. No I, I could understand that I mean you, you mentioned that the army thought itself in quite high regard mm. but when it came to an Iraq and Afghanistan your analysis is we failed perhaps you could summarize I mean it's a hugely complex subject yeah. summarize for our listeners why you believe we failed in those campaigns. Yeah, it is complicated. I mean, I think, again, I don't want to assume any knowledge from, from anyone listening. I'm sure there are people here who were intimately involved in those campaigns. But if first, I'll just give a brief narrative of how those events unfolded. So this all began with 9-11, 20 years ago this year. And initial British interventions began in that country, but in, in small numbers, um, again, often with special forces. And there was a, a residual presence in Kabul from 2002, but it was it was small. And I think that I started my narrative, and it was successful as well. Uh, I started my narrative with the, the drumbeat up to the Iraq invasion in 2003. And in that context, you had, as I explored, units that were still from this lineage of being based in Germany, um, preparing to, to fight the Russians, even though that was 14 years before, bringing out this, their equipment and so forth to invade Iraq. And the initial invasion, again, of which Britain sent 30,000 or so troops, but um, was part of a large American force, but it was successful. I think it's important to acknowledge that it was successful as well, that that bit of invading the country, of uh, defeating the, the uh, Saddam Hussein military, although I think it was not the right decision to do, that part worked, but it was then that it, it went sour afterwards. So there were essentially both the United States and Britain encountered not the, the kind of post-Balkans relatively banal environment they expected, but an increasing insurgency. And an, an area that I explore, again, is that at that period, with, again, apart from West Germany, Northern Ireland had been the shaping factor in the army's DNA. And I think there was an idea that Britain, via its experience in Belfast, but also in previous end of empire campaigns, had a kind of residual expertise in this, particularly compared to the Americans. But it, it it went sour. Um, I would say that the, the killing of um, soldiers from the Royal Military Police in 2003 in, in Ahmad al-Kabir would have been the beginning for that. But certainly by the next year, there was a, a full-throated insurgency campaign that was happening there. And it, in parallel, what happened was that particularly Iraq became acutely politically toxic in the UK. So it had been an enormously controversial invasion, and, and it became the thing that broke Tony Blair's uh, political legacy, really. But so, so the, the messaging and the signaling from London came to be to, to get troops out and to reduce numbers and so forth. And, and within, by 2005, this also looked like the direction the United States was going in. They were facing intense violence, effectively a civil war in Baghdad. Uh, but then there was a divergence of strategy. So under uh, George Bush, but also under David Petraeus, the United States determined this thing called the surge, so pouring in more troops and um, attempting to, to, to extract some kind of victory from this, which Britain had no appetite to do. And this created a, a major divergence in, in strategy, which concluded for the Brits in an extraordinary series of events in 2008, where uh, British troops 
effectively stayed leashed at the airport. I'm not permitted to go into battle while American and Iraqi forces um, cleared the city. And this was five years to the to the month after the Brits had arrived in Baghdad, speaking down, I would say, to the Americans about their perceived competences. And it ended with an American general walking into a British headquarters and saying that although well, although his wording is disputed, effectively saying we're here to stop you failing. And so I think there's a couple of caveats here. The first is that palpably the United States did not win the Iraq war either, and they didn't in Afghanistan. But I think I would say the main rationale and the reason that Britain went to war in Iraq in 2003 was to preserve and ideally strengthen its relationship with the United States military. And that was certainly damaged. What that happened in Afghanistan was there was a sense, I would argue, that from the, the leadership of the military that there needed to be an opportunity to make good what had gone wrong in Iraq. And this led to the engagement in, in the Helmand campaign from 2006, which was again purported as a reconstruction campaign, but became right from the get go, very violent and very aggressive. And, and what I explored in the book, and again, the argument I would make, which is disputed elsewhere, is that because of the, the nature of the army as an institution, although what happened in Helmand was not what the plan was, because it offered this opportunity for for fighting uh, and for the the use of the, the weapon systems and so forth, that these were things understandably that soldiers considered aspirational, but also the incentive structures that they faced, things like promotion and medals, all, all reinforced this. So Helmand became a self-sustaining kind of juggernaut for, for almost four years, really, where it, it was hugely significant if you were in the military, both emotionally and for your career to go and do it. There was then an attempt under US leadership to, to change the nature of the campaign, to make it less, less violent and less, and less aggressive and to train up local forces. And, and the, the Western troops withdrew in 2014. And there was then, I think what's interesting in the, in the, in the gap between when my book came out and now, as you say, the, the residual regime in Afghanistan uh, collapsed precipitously after the United States withdrawal. So I think in terms of, I think there's a couple of layers of this. I think you could make an argument that the post 9-11 wars put to bed this idea, as I put it, that you could go abroad with a rifle and, and do good in a straightforward manner, that interventionist idea that had been born out of the Balkans and, and things like that. I think there are certainly, so there's an argument that you know, just this, this wouldn't fly in the Muslim world. But I think a big point that I explore is that the way that militaries function as institutions makes it very difficult, A, to change track when things are going badly, and B, for people who are involved in these operations, and particularly at the sharp end, to, to stick their hand up and say something's not working. You know, it becomes a huge, uh, a huge juggernaut, ultimately, that, that can roll on, and, and it did roll on for years. Okay. In, in your in your book, you and, and just now you talked about command accountability. Yeah. Um, what's the link between the command and the politicians? Perhaps you'd like to say something about that, because you mentioned yeah. that in in a, in Iraq, the British had to stand by when the Americans and Afga uh, Iraqis went into. I think it was Basra. Yeah. But that that must have been a political decision, was it not? What's the linkage there? I think it's complicated. So you're right that ultimately the decisions to engage in these wars were made were made by politicians. But I would say that um, that since the advent of standing armies, really, uh, in the 17th or 18th century, there has been a, an understandable impulse from military leaders to, to find tasks and objectives and things to do. And I think this is, first, I think it's very understandable, because militaries are expensive to maintain. And that if you're in a, a, in a time of peace, there are constantly other priorities against um, a nation's expenditure and things to spend money on. And so it's in the nature of, of armies to, to push for things to do. And I think it's worth exploring this in, in the nature of a, a couple of particular points in, in the post 9-11 wars. So strikingly, and this is not well known, but when the United States began planning to invade Iraq, the initial American requests from the British were for special forces and use of basing. So this reflected an idea that politically it was significant to have a coalition, but ultimately militarily it was not needed. And the impetus to send what eventually went, which was a division, reflected lobbying by the military. Now, it could be suggested that that's something that's sinister or difficult. I don't think that really is the case. I think it's profoundly unsurprising because these are, um, it is perceived that this is a, 
a huge opportunity and that if it's one that's not taken it will leave the army at risk of of being cut but certainly in 2003 there was major push by the military establishment to engage at the scale that they did and secondly a significant pivot point here is 2006 in uh in afghanistan where as i showed in the book the army's own reconnaissance documents said that the, the levels of forces they needed were vastly in advance of, of what was on the table to take and and the the line that was pushed back was like no we, we have to do this and i think that, that the key point here is about how that interface between the political and the military level operates and for that to function you need to have primacy of political power and acknowledgement that in a democracy ultimately as you say the buck or at least the decision making is made by politicians but you also need a professional senior officer cast that is willing to say no or that is willing to push back in in a rigorous way and that i think is is not something that existed and the, my my feeling really on on a lot of why this happened is having spoken to a lot of the the very serious senior uniformed people who who ran these wars i interviewed in the third book my feeling is that their overwhelming priority and again, I think it is an understandable one, was to try and protect the, the army, which was the institution in which they spent their professional lives and in, in which they loved. And I think love is, is the right word. And I think ultimately, particularly that the very senior military leadership perceived their role almost as custodial, that, you know, you would receive this institution, which you've been in for 35 years, for, for two or three years, and it's your job to protect it. And that in particular, in an environment in which the army has been cut sequentially for 70 years that means protecting it from cuts and in that environment it was crucial a to maintain its perceived standing but also to find things to do and, and i would say this this idea that you cannot understand the helmet campaign without understanding the internal politics of the army and the attempt of the army existential survival i, I would suggest and the tragedy of this in some ways is that because these campaigns did not work that that use it or lose it which was the famous point supposedly that that general Danat, the head of the army said about about helmand became use it and lose it so the army has been cut aggressively off, after this and it's interesting now in in defense that with the new chief of the defense staff as an admiral i think it, it is likely that we are ushering in a decade in which the the key focus in, in british defense is probably going to be naval rather rather than military but but uh, to, to summarize that point, and this is to quote a serving army officer who I spoke to relatively recently, he would suggest that in British public life, the, the army is indemnified. So it is essentially protected if things go wrong, that there will always be a, a loyal um, constituency who will be willing to say this was all the politicians' fault. And I would say it's not that there's not political culpability, but that that idea where you know, you do not carry any responsibility at all, that is dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. We've worked, it's very interesting you say that. I mean, the, the British Army has worked on trained in high intensity conflict mm. and you can drop down to low intensity. Is that philosophy flawed as far as you're concerned? The Army decided it was, yeah. I mean, I, again, to expand on this for people who, who perhaps are less familiar with the territory than you and I hear here is that this was this was the doctrinal idea around the time of the millennium so at that point again coming out of the the cold war period where the army was was preparing to fight the russians that and also particularly based on a, a training establishment that that existed in canada called batis the british army training um unit suffield which allowed large armored forces to to fight each other under laser simulation this was what was significant it was what was aspirational and it ultimately was what corresponded to careers and advancement and there was an idea that if you could do that if you could do this complicated ballet of, of moving vehicles and coordinating with artillery and, and airstrikes and things that the other tasks such as peacekeeping such as peace support were attainable i would say this is probably partly born out of the northern ireland experience where at least in the early years of the troubles they would re-roll say armored units from west germany to go to to northern ireland and they found that it was feasible to do that and and they as the point is you can retrain a tank unit to go and do internal security duties in two or three months but try doing that the other way around try you know training a, a light infantry unit to go and operate 
um, tanks. You can't do that. It's much more complicated. So I can understand where it came from, but certainly the army's own lesson learned documents suggested that was flawed. And I think in many ways, the, the point here is, is cultural. So in, in Northern Ireland, it was a different culture, but at the same time, it was a culture with a common language and with some common threads of experience and with residual intelligence capacities and going in into Iraq and Afghanistan these were alien environments and ultimately in which people did not speak the language and that is not something you know it's enormously complicated being in a, in a quasi policing quasi political officer job in in those areas and it's interesting now that certainly that at least in theory, the army has created these ideas that, that particular bits of the army will develop regional expertise. So they, whether it will be West Africa or, or parts of Asia or things like that with, with languages so that that will happen again. But it's not an easy thing to do. Okay. I mean, turning to your book now, I mean, clearly you did a huge amount of research. Um, where on earth did you start? Um, what, what did this entail and how long are we talking about? Uh, and indeed, I guess, what cross-referencing did you carry out to make sure that what you're being told was actually true? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, it was a long process. So from conception to publication took eight years. So I conceived the book in, in 2013 and it was published this year. But actually, in terms of how long it took to write, it took about three and a half years to write. So I, I got a book deal in, in 2015 and... Um, there was then, and we could come to in due course, that the kind of complexities of bringing it to publication took two years as well. So really the, the reporting and the writing took two and a, uh, three and a half years. So a, a period of time comparable to a PhD. And in terms of going into it, I, I knew how to write magazine journalism. So long form narrative pieces. This is my day job of, of five, six, 7,000 words um, in often in difficult places. And, and that was, so I had a background in doing that kind of thing, but I had not written a book before. And I remember right at the start, I was, I was asking various people's advice about how this would go well before I had a book deal. And I remember speaking to Tom Ricks, the American author who wrote Fiasco and The Gamble and, and big, big books about the US military. And he said, with a nonfiction book, there is a one-to-one -one ratio between the amount of work that you put into it and how good it is. And I think that's probably true, you know, but I, but I sort of thought, okay, that's fine. So I, I have to you know, really do this. I wasn't working full time on it at, at the time. That wasn't financially feasible. I continued my magazine work throughout and, and so forth. But the, the key complexity initially was how this would be structured. So the initial idea I had felt was that there were discrete stories to tell about equipment, about relationships with the, the Americans, about tactics, and that you could divide it thematically in, in those areas. But the problem with doing that is you, you would create an anthology, right? It would be a selection of essays and it, it wouldn't hold together as a book. And a lot of time that I spent when I was developing this idea was, you know, what was the an organizing motif that could hold this together. And I look, I remember going to the National Army Museum and looking at belts with different strands and things like that, something that I could use as a metaphor. And the initial idea that I had, which lasted partially in the book, but not completely, was to use as the organizing metaphor, a mnemonic, as you know, the army loves acronyms and, and mnemonics, um, called um, pro-war, which is um, pre Hang on, I'm trying to remember it. Preparation for battle, reaction to effective enemy fire, enemy location, winning the firefight, assault, and reorganization. So the section, the section battle drill, which is taught to, to all recruits as to how they should behave in, in combat. And the idea was that each, that would be five sections and I would tell a, a discrete story. And, and my real idea was that I wanted to zoom in in order to zoom out, that I didn't, I wanted to tell a story that was about people and individuals and characters, and that it was better to focus more on smaller episodes in order, and then have the macro story told between them. So the idea was it would be this, these five parts, and each would be a, a kind of discrete story, and it would correspond to the whole. And that survives in... Um, uh, in two parts so um well in one part really only so the first part of the book is called preparation for battle and actually there are five not six and all that so it didn't really end up in the end but but the broad idea that i would take these this multi-part structure 
worked. And I, and I, I determined I wanted to write about the experience of the regiment that I'd briefly been part of, but the year before I was there for the opening. I was interested in this episode in, in Iraq with the Black Watch in 2004. It also seemed that the, the end game for um, the Danui Moy or Charge of the Knights in, in Basra was important. And, and that it would be just great stories, but I was really feeling my way through doing this. So I just started interviewing people. And in the end, I interviewed 260 people over three years, so a lot. But it took, um, you know, I ended up doing too much research for the beginning and not enough for the end. It was a huge learning process as I went through it. And then as you, as you allude to, you don't have to cross-reference it. So with any act of reportage like this, what you find is you will talk to people and I could talk to people that was the in some ways the luxury of this in comparison to say people who write about the second world war I'm fascinated how they do it because everyone is dead you know there's no there's a huge wealth of yeah. archival and secondary material but the luxury with this was almost that you know this was in living memory and so I could I could go to people and I but what you find in that situation and particularly in a situation like this where in many cases things had not gone well that to, to give an analogy, say, if I'd been writing a book about the Falklands, I think there would have been what I would have found amongst the people I'd spoken to would, in many, not all cases, but there would have been a, an attempt to take, you know, to claim credit for, for, you know, having won the Battle of Goose Green or whatever. That would be, people would be fighting over who, whose credit it was. But often here it was the inverse because things had not gone well. And so it was often a, people would attempt to deflect responsibility or blame onto others which is natural it's 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 very human thing to do but what you then have to do is is kind of cross-reference but you know people's individual accounts and that's a lot of corresponding going back to people and saying look like you know this this version of events is this is what you told me but I've also been told this version here you know can, can we reconcile this what what's what are your thoughts here and, and things like that and that is a it's a difficult process it can be a vexed process but it's ultimately where the rigor not just of this, but of any any kind of reporting comes because you you do your best to to play it as it lays. And as you know yourself, there's there's 90 pages of, of end notes at the end of this book, which is a lot of people you know, additional information or where a account of a particular event varies, giving someone the opportunity to have their say. And but what I think is also lacking in the book, actually, in some ways, is that this is not exclusively but predominantly a, a tale told from one side so it was you know I spoke to Iraqis and, and things like that and I'd been to Afghanistan but it is largely told through the experience of, of Westerners and that is you know there, there is some incredible reporting that has come out telling the other side of it I also think it's somewhere the function of time so people say with Vietnam now are starting to write books where you have you know equally um, nuanced perspective from the the Vietnamese side as as say from the American side and that you know this would be a better thing if that happened but it, you know I didn't think it was hugely feasible to do it that way this time but yeah it was a huge act of, of cross-referencing and um yeah it certainly you know it ruffled feathers doing that you, you said there was a 260 interviews but there was surely well from what I read there were some people turned around and having given an interview then rescinded their permission to publish and yeah that created a problem I mean was that a large proportion or no, was that no, starving no. officers or was it retired officers or was there any identifiable group that did that? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can explain all of this. So I, it, I didn't really talk. The vast majority of people I spoke to had left because this was not, from the start, this was not what is termed an, an authorised book. So in general, and I explore this in the book and, and in contrast to the Americans who take a more open approach, with the British there is there are restrictive covenants about journalistic access to the army and in a sense yeah. they trade it, it's a transactional approach that trades access for pre-publication oversight um ostensibly on on grounds of operational security or personnel security but it's often used to for a wider kind of gutting in some ways of what happened so i was determined i was not going to work within that formal system because i felt that it was it was editorially problematic mm -hmm. So I, the, the majority of the reporting that I did was speaking to people who'd left. Now, in the end, actually, because of the way these things always work, I spoke to quite a lot of people who were still in the army off the record, not using their names, things like that. But certainly during, you know, I then had to do this big act of, of going back and checking things. And a huge complexity of this was just the scale 
of the, the project. So I'm, I was very familiar with how you fact checked a, a piece of magazine journalism that might be 5,000 words long. Um, generally, what I would do in that context would be, would be a lot of writing questionnaires of going to people and say, look, we discussed this, you know, this mm -hmm. is the discrepancy between your account and the other. Can you clarify or, or often just asking for more detail, saying, can you explain what this looked like, smelt like, felt like? And I did that for the first scene of this book that takes place on a training exercise in Canada. And it took a month to, to, to fact check one scene. And I realized I was running into this profound problem of scale and that I was behind my deadlines. This book is 35 times as long as a magazine article in in its published form and I wasn't going to be able to do that and so what I shifted to doing was taking sections of first draft text which I had written having done the, the reporting but it, it was not all nailed down and boiled down and sending emails to people saying look this is a, a text that relates to this this covers a period you're involved in can you indicate here what's accurate what's not other information that, that you think is generally and that was more efficient from a time perspective for me but what it also did was it did mean you were sending out material that, that was quite rough and it did have an accuracy then and, and you were doing that in order to to boil that down but it did mean that this was you know it was a more kind of vexed and in some ways confrontational process than, than you could have and I think what is certainly what I've learned learned from this is I think what is the, the platonic ideal with with doing this is if is you know to people can understand why you're doing that stuff if you explain it to them you say look i'm trying to be fair here i'm trying to give people an equal crack of the whip this is this is what we're doing but it's also i had to do this on a kind of industrial scale you know it was just me i had no research assistant to think so you know i had you know it was quite a mass and quite an impersonal process in some ways and it certainly created some anxiety and in some cases it was about seven people so a, a small number but said look you know, take, take me out, don't do this. And often it was where I had to go back and, and check kind of difficult stuff. So for example, one person I'd spoken to about casualties in, in Iraq in 2004, and I wanted to go back to check some points and you would have encountered this reaction, which was like, take me out of the book. And I think it's important to say here, you know, there are, there are pretty accepted bits of journalistic practice in these situations. And in every, with everyone that I had approached, I'd, I'd clearly indicated that I was writing a book. I hadn't you know, hidden my purpose or anything like that. I'd recorded interviews with people. So there was a tape record of it, but also that, and, and, and the basic principle that applies in those contexts, and this is legally supported as well, is like, if you've, if you've said it, you can't back it off the record that something, something exists, it exists there. I think it's worth probably bringing in a bit of kind of self-reflective nuance here, which is that although I had been careful to be open about what I was doing, very scrupulously open about it. There is no doubt, I think, that because of my background, because I'd had a brief period of, of military service myself, and particularly because I knew the language, you know, I looked in some ways familiar. And I, you know, I was absolutely clear that I was writing a book, but it's, you know, this would, I think, probably not have been possible if I had not had that demeanor that allowed me access to this thing. And, and I'm sure with some people I spoke to, there would have been a sense of, you know, oh, you know, we thought you were one of us and actually you were you were doing something else. And that relates to the kind of insider, outsider point of it. But I think, so, so you know, there were, and essentially what then happened with the book was that it was, um, it, I'd gone through this, this sort of vast process of this and it was two months out from publication at the beginning of 2019. And then a, I had to do a final bit of, of going back to um, one individual to, to offer them an opportunity to respond on a point. And I'd had a visiting fellowship at, um, at Oxford at the Change of Character of War program at the university there while I was writing this. And um, that the, the person I'd written to then wrote to the head of that program. And he then, I, I'd, I'd had very little to do with him for the last year or so because it had been clear that although he was a, I won't name him here, his name's in the public domain and it can be found online, but it, um, although he's a smart and well-read guy, it was clear he did have close relations with the military and I had, he'd effectively kind of broken off relations with me when it was clear that my book was, was ruffling feathers. But he then wrote to my publishers and said that you're going to get sued when the book is published. And I said, look, yeah, as I said to you here, this, you know, I don't think this is credible given that this guy has very close relations with the army. Although I'm sure he felt himself to be in a difficult position because I was on his books and he had very senior officers calling him up going, you know, what is, what is Aikam doing and, and things like that. But he wrote to Penguin, Penguin panicked and um, they, they, they 
lay out, out a pretty extraordinary set of demands, which was that, that I would um, give the book to the Ministry of Defence to be edited by them, and that I would also instigate um, a process called copy approval, which is where everyone signs off in writing what is read, written about them. And that is not um, the way that, that serious journalism is conducted. It's the, it's the behest of celebrity magazine profiles and so forth. And um, there was also, I, I, and I, I pushed back against these, these things, but to no avail, it showed a lot of reporting documentation. And they, uh, they canceled my contract and they then asked me to pay back all the money that I had um, received for the book uh, and also pay half of their legal fees. So I think definitely a sense of a, a kind of intimidatory move, really. And, but I, I felt this was wrong and I, I organized a, I'm also, I would say that having got to this, by this point, I was three and a half years into the, the process and I had faced a lot of resistance writing the book as well, you know, attempts to intimidate me and, and so forth. And I, um, I also think of that situation, this is kind of your, your command moment as a journalist as well. It's when you're, you know, you have to determine what kind of person and what kind of writer you are. And so I coordinated a, a coalition of, of eight press freedom organizations who wrote to Random House and didn't change their position. And so I gave the material to The Guardian who covered it. And then um, a, I, I got in touch with a, an Australian publisher called Scribe who'd worked in a similar situation with a book called Billion Dollar Whale that had uh, a major British publisher had uh, commissioned it and then refused to publish it after threats. And then there was then a, another protracted battle to get the um, to get the the rights, the copyright to the manuscript back because effectively what, what PRH tried to do was was to say that they they would only release the copyright if I signed a, a non-disclosure agreement, which I again was was unwilling to do. Um, and, but so eventually we we were able to to buy the the rights back and and the book was published and it, I think partly because of that controversy that had existed pre publication it, it generated or it contributed to the the level of discussion and coverage so, so the book was reviewed everywhere and, and things I think it's also significant to say that there has been no legal action or or any any threat like that beforehand I think and these that, threats know, were le for legal action were they they were liable they they. No. Soon for libel or well it, it's inter it is it is interesting and that there are some limits on what what i can say at, at this stage about this of but course. I, I um i received no direct but for while while the book was at prh i um i received no legal threats whatsoever directly so i had a lot of interaction and back and forth with people and some of it was vexed but but no lawyer's letters at all but you you, you mm. said a minute ago that you were where you suffered. Well, well uh, let me from... let me explain. Let me explain what, what happened. So then this this guy at Oxford said it was it was all indirect, it was all at one remove. He was saying, like, you he wrote to the publisher saying you will get sued by and they went back and said by who, and he named various people, none of whom have, have subsequently sued. And then interestingly, there was this other element in it in that I write in the book um about the, the gestation of um special forces memoirs, particularly in the 1990s. And um Again, I say this with some delicacy, but I think it's, it's significant in that I read about the origin of the Andy McNabb um, yeah. phenomenon. And that, um, interestingly, McNabb was was published also by, by PRH. And I think perhaps there was a bit of naivete on my behalf, thinking that, you know, obviously he's a, he's a hugely commercially significant property for the publisher. And there was pressure um, before, uh, before the book when the book was still a PRH, there was pressure from McNabb and his representatives to have him withdrawn from the book. And then after it was moved to another publisher, I received repeated legal threats from, from McNabb. Um, but, but it is interesting that those, those were actually the only lawyer's letters that, that I got. You know, there were, no, there were no others at all in the whole interaction with, with 260 people. And, and I think, you know, in some ways, what I'd said to them before this happened, I have been vindicated in this, right? There was, you know, there was various, uh, you know, attempts at, in, at intimidation and things like that, but I didn't think there was anything. I think I'd done my due diligence as a journalist and my sense is that that has been borne out since the book has been published. But it, it's also certainly true, I think, that through that experience, I learned an enormous amount. And I think particularly this point that, that I alluded to earlier, that the, the kind of platonic ideal that you should have as a reporter, and it's hard to do, it requires 
empathy and, and emotional intelligence is, is to be able to explain to people you're writing about and say, look, like we're going to be going over some really difficult stuff here. And we're going to be like talking about stuff that is difficult and, and personal to you. And you have to understand that, like, I'm going to write about this without, I'm not going to hide anything. But at the same time, I'm going to make real efforts to get this right. And I'm going to make real efforts to get it fair. And I'm going to give you a fair crack of the whip. And I think, you know, if you, people can fundamentally understand that as a principle, because it is, it is fair as a thing to do. And I think that I'm certainly, I'm certainly better at that now through, through the process of, of having done, having done this and having, having worked with it. But it's, um, I think it's also an interesting point, Keith, in some ways here is that I think if I wrote this book now, so I'm, I'm 36 mm -hmm. now. Um, I wrote this largely between the ages of kind of 27 and, and 33. And I think if I wrote it now, it would be a different book, right? It would probably be more measured. It would probably be a bit less sharp edged. But I also think it kind of needed to be the book it was because that was a, th these were conflicts that as, as most wars are, were, were prosecuted by young people and that someone you know, we've alluded to it before this this quite cozy ecosystem that exists in the United mm -hmm. Kingdom of discussion around the military and, and stuff like that. And I think someone needed to kind of pull pull off the bandaid, you know, is, is a way I would say about it. So and maybe the way to summarize that is if in, in 25 years time, we're coming to the end of another long series of conflicts with a uh, an equivocal at best or, or difficult outcome. I won't be the person to write the big book about that, you know. I'm, I'll be, so there's not another book in you. <laughs> well, no. I mean, I think there certainly there certainly is. But I'm, I mean, the, the project I'm developing at the moment is not about the military at all. Right. It's actually about mountaineering. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm interested in writing. Certainly, so doing you can some, talk to us next year about mountaineering. <laughs> well, I think it might take a bit longer to, to, to do that. But I'm certainly interested in writing some journalism about the military. So I'm doing a, a profile for the Economist, where my where my day job is. I'm doing. A, a profile of the French Foreign Legion, and I'd be interested in um, in possibly writing about some of the procurement issues that the army has has produced. But I think it, it's funny with this. I think often with things that I write, consciously or otherwise, I'm trying to to scratch some itch or to work something out in my head. And I suppose with this book, the question was what what would it have been like if rather than if I'd gone back to the army after university, if I had gone and sure. and, and had those experiences. And and I think that I've kind of for me I've, I've sort of worked that out and I think like that it's it's kind of it's given me a level of a level of closure and what is has been touching is if it hasn't I, I think I've just had a lot of people writing saying they found the book cathartic you know and yeah. this has I mean, this you, a, you said since you published the Vindicate is that is that part of it people have written to you and, yeah. and said I mean it's a bit like me I read the book and I could identify a huge amount with it yeah. um as I said before I left before 9-11, but there was so much that, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, the mail, the mail has been incredible, actually. And, and I would say, like, I haven't been able to reply to it all, but I do, I do intend to. And I, you know, it, it's been really valuable. And not, not everyone has agreed with everything I've written at all. But, you know, people have said, you know, I, and it's just been very touching. But what has been kind of fascinating is that they've written about the book, but often they've written about themselves you know so they've written so i some a guy wrote me a three chapter account of his entire military career and, and sent it to me and i've had these long kind of personal you know um messages about no no that's fine writing about writing about their experience and i think what is what i find fulfilling as a writer is this idea that you have created something that that has has resonated with people or particularly that has allowed a because I, I felt with the army that there were a lot of quite low hanging fruit in terms of that there's a, there were all these conventions that you know we we dealt exclusively in the tropes of heroism and we never you know discussed the, the difficulties or this idea that that everything always went well and the Brits were always fantastically good at this and, and stuff which is which is obviously if you think about it critically unsustainable as when you think about any human endeavor particularly one as chaotic as war but because there was such a kind of codified way of writing about these things that if you just tried to go in and and sort of write something that was pretty unvarnished and pretty raw you'd suddenly find people being as you said yourself like wow i that that echoed with me you know that that hit hit kind of how 
how it is or or how it was and so yeah i've i've i think i've also found that you know it, it's been obviously this is my first book and it's had it's had a lot of coverage and that's been profession it's sold well and that that is all professionally very gratifying but these expressions from individuals that this has resonated with them and that ultimately that it it resonated with them as even if they weren't involved like you know as as with yourself if they weren't there in the the periods of time necessarily in question but but the broader themes resonated with them i found that very moving i mean whilst we've been talking questions some questions have come in and the one that is very opposite at the moment that major general in the royal marines that committed mm. suicide i mean yeah. have we learned from this accountability because it would appear the way he was dealt with was was uh, well open to question shall we say i mean yeah. have you got views on that yeah i mean i'm not super across the details of, of jim Holmes' suicide so i mean a number of people had written to me about it um and i, I you know i understand that there's there's stuff that was going on but i don't know enough about it to to consider it or, or or to give a kind of considered point on that but i do think this accountability idea is is central and a point that that i raised and i've read i've read this in print is is that there has been a change here so if you look back at the histories of the second or the first world war there was a clear idea that you know people starred officers brigadier or brigadier generals as they were called and, and upwards that if things went wrong that that they were relieved of their command and other people were brought in and and what you found in um in the united kingdom but also in the united states after the second world war was that that culture changed and it became and again this is not my analogy this is thomas rix's but that to be a, a general officer became almost like a, a tenured position as though that you, so a job that you could lose for moral indiscretion, but you could not lose for operational outcome. And it, it's worth caveating that with the point that, although obviously a, a conflict like the Second World War was, was vastly greater in scale than these conflicts that I read about in the book, in many ways, it was much easier to determine success or failure. Did you take the town? Did you move the front line forward? You know, ultimately, Eisenhower's job as a Supreme Allied Commander was to take Berlin, right? So it's a straightforward, quantifiable, objective which is very different to what we experienced so there's a difference with that but ultimately i think the reason that this accountability change happened was about stake and it was that it, it, those conflicts were existential for the united kingdom and when that is the case the the, the role and the performance of the army stands at, in in glaring focus uh, as though as they say the pandemic has now and and when things go wrong, there, there are changes. And, and, and these wars, because they were far away and they were fought by a professional army, do not. But I think also the, the problem that, that we have in the military now is that, is that at senior levels, relief is terminal. So if you look, there has been in the last year these extraordinary instances about uh, people fiddling school fees allowance, so CEA, which, um, and, and a, a two-star went, went to jail for that another a lieutenant colonel did as well and, and my my sense on that is actually a lot of people were doing this right this was a sort of thing that was and i write in the book about how with armies they have rigid systems for good reason but and actually to make things tolerable day to day there has to be a whole system of breaking rules alongside making rules and that this is something where it was sort of winked at and, and accepted and, and it changed but so so like people have fallen foul for that but there has been not you know there was no there was a decoupling of operational outcome and you know progression in, in a career and that is i mean maybe a point i did not explore especially in the book is that it's not unique to the military you know if you look at the outcome of the 2008 financial crisis which had huge impact on very many millions of people and no no bankers went to jail or, or things like that but i think that this this idea that you know that, that, that it's almost a human resources problem right you if you have a, a senior you never bring in people from outside as a civilian institution where everyone comes up through the system but if you're going to do that how do you you know when things go wrong you, you you need to have a way to deal with it and at the moment that that does not does not really exist i think in in the british military mm. there's, there's a question here um did command on the ground in both campaigns change too often? Uh, should we, the British have employed a two-star level or above um, for a longer period, like in World War II? Yeah, I think I think they did. I think it did change too often. So again, for people who are not familiar, 
the, the British ran these campaigns on a, on a six month roulement system so that units themselves were rotated six months, but also the entire command structure uh, up to in, in Iraq, it was run by a two star by a major general, it was a bit different in in Afghanistan, but essentially what you had were a discrete series of six month wars and people would, would come in and, and have a tendency and a temptation to reinvent the wheel. And this maintained itself because what it meant was that a large number of, of senior commanders could, could get that crucial operationally deployed tick on, on their thing, on, on their career progression. But it also, because the cycles were not staggered, it meant that everyone changed and rolled out. And again, the Northern Ireland comparison is interesting here in that there was a permanent headquarters in Northern Ireland at Lisbon. And PGHQ in the United Kingdom, the permanent joint headquarters at Northwood set up in 1996 was meant to have this, this continuous role, but it didn't really, and it didn't really work like that. So I think there is a clear argument that if this kind of enduring stabilization operation happens, that key roles should be for longer, probably for a year, and that there should be a staggering of rotation which again happened in northern ireland so you would have some units providing continuity and and not i think that is one really pretty clear lesson that has come out of these conflicts okay i mean we, we, yeah i mean as i say questions are come in there there's another one here and i've got to read it's my brother-in-law um <laughs> in fact he's asked he's asked two but I'll, um he, excuse me when i put the glass my glasses on because it's quite small print uh, he said, isn't there an evolution in strategy and planning in Afghan over time? There's a learning cycle where the military adapts and also different politicians over this prolonged period. Doesn't that suggest there will be periods where planning is more closely aligned than other periods? Well, first of all, A, did you understand that? And B, <laughs> views? I think, I, think I, I understood elements of that. I mean, it's certainly true that there was very rapid role in, in the political side and in the in the defense secretary side. I think a, a broader point is that my impression for a lot of these campaigns was that individuals on the ground and even quite far up the command system would have great difficulty explaining why they were there or what they were there to do and, and things like that. And there was not a notion of single kind of unified strategy. Um, that is problematic. and and. But it also reflects the, the idea that these conflicts were in many ways fought for reasons that were internal to the military rather, rather than external. But the point I would perhaps leave on with that, and I think this is interesting if, because it speaks to a lot of this question about is it the fault of the politicians or the military. I think that if Cameron had not pulled out in 2014, that there, and, and if the American broader security umbrella had continued, there is a good chance that the British army would still be in Helmand today. You know, losing 30 guys a year, saying, bringing back a lot of medals and saying, like, just give us two more years and we'll sort it out. You know, I think I think the problem was that the system did not have the wherewithal for someone to say, stop. And that, and that ultimately that I think needs to be needs to be reflected as well. Did I mean, did did the army when we went in, I mean, there was a political decision, but the army then changed all that. And some of the elements that went in there were, were not ideal for what they, they were trying to achieve. Yeah, that, that is true. And, and equipment, particularly early in this campaign, was a huge point of controversy. One I write about in the book with these um, unsuitable vehicles, particularly soft skin vehicles designed in Northern Ireland. And it is, I wanted to write about the the it's called UOR, Urgent Operational Requirements, in, in the book, because I thought it was significant. And I also thought, in many ways, what happened with that was impressive. So that, that under enormous pressure of time, these vehicles were, new vehicles were brought in, which, which saved a lot of soldiers' lives. But I think what's significant about that is, is, is twofold. The first is that it's about incentives, that, that all this could happen because all the stars lined up. So, you know, the funding was available, the, the political will was there and, and so forth. But it's also been interesting what the knock-on of that with the army more recently has been, and particularly with, with Ajax, with this equipment program that's experienced such profound difficulties over the last 10 years with upwards of three billion pounds spent and, and no result. And this idea that, that this attempt to bend itself into shape for Afghanistan left the army with, you know, what were we gonna do with these vehicles, these masters and stuff, they, they couldn't go off road. They were designed for a very specific job at a very specific time. Um, but yeah, the kit is, 
the kit and, and the sort of unpreparedness point, I think, is is significant, and that was something I explored in the book. Okay. Sadly, I think we're we're kind of running out, we've run out of time. Uh, what I would like to do is to thank you on behalf of the Berwick Literary Festival, myself and the audience, for elucidating so clearly your thoughts uh, on, on this book. I've been thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. It's opened my eyes, so thank you very much indeed. Um, yeah. So, Simon, thank you. I, I would also like to thank our sponsor, Keith Thomas, of Premier Building, again. Um, thank you also the technical people behind the scenes. Um, you're not seen or heard, clearly Simon and I have beforehand, but you're not seen and heard unless there are hiccups. And apart from knocking over a stand, <laughs> that was my fault, there'd been no hiccups. Um, so it just remains me to thank you for turning up and listening to us today. Uh, if you've enjoyed it, please mention it on any social media you have. And we are a totally voluntary society, or virtually uh, totally voluntary society. So any donations will be very gratefully received. And there'll be slides at the end telling you how you can do that. So Simon, thank you very much again. I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. And uh, we'll talk about atomic demolition munition officers at some point. I'd, I'd be thanks fascinated again. to hear that. Thank you so much, Keith. And thanks to everyone thanks. who tuned in. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.